what troubled me about my departure from NBC was that it didn't end as it should have on a grace note. It shouldn't have ended with that kind of friction and that kind of confusion. I wish that, that we had tied a ribbon around it in a way that was more mutually respectful and that reflected the quality of what we did together for four decades and how mutually beneficial it was and how much fun it was and how gratifying it was. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son Troy each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Bob Costas, you are a legend. Everyone has heard you announce everything from the World Series, the Super Bowl, the Kentucky Derby, and even the Olympics. You have an unthinkable 28 Emmys and awards too numerous to mention. Welcome to our podcast. This is not the first time you have done me a favor. You were kind enough to give me an inspiring quote for my first ever New York Times bestseller. So thank you twice. <laughs> I remember that. And of course, I remember our shared Syracuse background, me as an aspiring broadcaster, you as a guy already tabbed for the NFL where you had a terrific career and then on to broadcasting yourself. So happy to be with you again and happy to see you, Troy. There we got three orange men on the call. And there you go. What did you major in or need I ask? Did you go to Newhouse, Troy? I didn't. I actually, I did philosophy, but then I went to Syracuse Law School. So I'm a, uh -huh. I'm a fellow lawyer. Yeah. So don't hold it against me. It's always an upset <laughs> when someone says they went to Syracuse, and then you find out they didn't go to Newhouse. <laughs> but here's, here's my question, just bypassing your dad for just a second here. Yeah. A philosophy degree. It's a great thing to have for your personal development, you know, and, yeah. and how you think and how you view the world. Turning it into a professional career, you know, you can't walk around going, hey, I, I'm like <laughs> 10 generations removed from Descartes. Will you hire me? Yeah, I think, therefore, I am. That's what I said right, in my job right. interview. <laughs> there you go. You know, I, I, uh, I transferred. So I went to I was down at UCF and then I transferred to Syracuse uh, really mostly for football and to be closer to family and all that. Uh -huh. And uh, I lost some credits in the transfer. And so I was in the business school originally at Syracuse Whitman. And they said I was going to have to do an extra semester to graduate on time. And I knew I was going to end up going to law school. So I called the law school admissions. And I was, I guess I was 18 or 19. I said, hey, what's your, what major should I do? And they're like, what the heck are you talking about? <laughs> do whatever you want. <laughs> and I said, well, what's the most uh, accepted major? And they said, and th that year it was uh, philosophy first, then English second, and then uh, political science was third. So then I just decided to do philosophy. I didn't really know what I was getting myself into. <laughs> <laughs> it probably helps. In the long run, probably helps, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it was it, it seemed a lot more fun, too, than, than business classes. There you go. All right. So where were we before I hit a detour? <laughs> what was it like growing up on the North Shore of Long Island? Did you have any siblings? Do you remember when you first fell in love with baseball? Yes. Uh, I had a younger sister who has passed away. Uh, she was two years younger uh, than I. Um, my dad, and you may have heard this before because I've occasionally mentioned it, my dad was an inveterate gambler. Um, gambled on baseball, football, basketball. If he was desperate, he'd gamble on hockey if that was the only <laughs> action he could get. And so I learned a lot of sports just sitting around watching and listening to games with him. I would have been a fan anyway, but he was obviously intensely invested in these games when the mortgage is riding on whether Will Chamberlain can hit two free throws or Whitey Ford can get Al Kaline to hit into a double play, then your your attention is 
is heightened. Um, and so I think I was smart enough to realize I was a better schoolyard athlete than people would guess because they see me interviewing athletes that are much bigger than me. And clearly I wasn't going to go to Syracuse on an athletic scholarship, but I was pretty good in the, you know, in the sandlot or shooting baskets in the schoolyard. But I was smart enough to know when I was like 10 years old, if I was ever going to get into an arena or a stadium without buying a ticket, it would be to have a press pass, not to be on the field or on the court. And so I began to think about that as a major. And then in high school, um, my guidance counselor told me that Syracuse was on the very short list of places to go. Um, and so I did. And it really was a great choice for me uh, because of the background I got at WAER and in the communications classes. But even then, there was a developing Syracuse network, which now is so sprawling you can barely turn around in a network office without bumping into someone from Syracuse. But Syracuse was a credential even then in the mid-1970s, and it helped to, to launch my career, and things went from there. Uh, and to regarding baseball, like any kid in the 50s or 60s, you know, I liked all sports, but baseball then was the unquestioned national pastime. And growing up on Long Island, the Dodgers and Giants had left. The Mets didn't exist yet. It was only the Yankees, and that was okay because they won the pennant almost every year, and Mickey Mantle was their greatest player, so it was natural that I would become a Mickey Mantle fan. I have a cousin who's my closest lifelong friend, but he's a few years older than me. So he remembered Willie Mays as a New York giant. That's why he was a Willie Mays fan his whole life. And I was a Mickey Mantle fan. Um, but as it turned out, I was lucky enough to become very good friends with both of them, with both Mickey and Willie. Did your father's gambling take away from the love of sports? Or do you think, obviously, when you were younger, it got you into it. Yeah. But as you got older and realized what he was doing, did it make you, did it take away from the fun, I guess? Or did it make it more, uh, that much more entertaining? Oh, it took away from the fun on many occasions, because especially if he was betting against the team I wanted to root for, <laughs> I had to suppress my rooting interest, which is hard when you're like 10 or 11 years old and you have the exuberance of a kid. Uh, my mom and my sister didn't like it at all. And often they would flee to my grandmother's house or something to get away from the tension and the anger of it all. But I always stayed. I wrote it out, whether he was winning or, or losing. That was the bond between my dad and me. And unfortunately, he died of a heart attack at the age of 42 when I was 18. Wow. It was like a week or two after I'd been accepted at Syracuse. So he never lived to see anything I did on the air. Uh, and I've often thought about the experiences I could have given him, experiences that I then gave my own children and being around some of these great sports events. But on the other hand, since he was a compulsive gambler, would he have been hitting me up for inside information? Not that I had all that much. Or would he do to me what I heard him do all the time to announcers when I was a little kid? Curse at them because they were bringing him bad news, whether they knew it or not. <laughs> Who could dislike Mel Allen or Lindsey Nelson? But he did if, if the game was going the wrong way. So I wondered if he would you know, save his own son. God damn it, Bobby, shut the F up. You know, well. did, your, did you kind of always have a voice for it too? It seems like. No, you're, no. Really? When, when I got to Syracuse, I had heard my voice on a little cassette recorder when I was like 15 years old and I got as a Christmas present, I would sit in front of the television set with the game on and the sound down and pretend to be broadcasting the game. But I never heard myself on the air until I was a freshman at Syracuse at WAER. And I was absolutely appalled. I, I listened to this thin, tinny voice, still vestiges of a New York accent, central New York weather. And I'm thinking I'm doomed. Talk about changing your major. I was thinking I better figure out something else. And then I heard Al Michaels. I didn't even know who Al Michaels was. He was then the voice of the Cincinnati Reds, and they were in the World Series. And then they would take one announcer from each team. It's not the same anymore. They take one announcer from each team and put them on network radio and television. And I'm listening to Al Michaels, and I'm thinking, this guy sounds a little like Vin Scully. Who is he? Not so easy to find out then. You can't Google anything then in the early 1970s. And I find out he's the voice of the Reds and he's 26 years old. And now I'm thinking I'm double doomed. How can I possibly be as good as this guy? He's only a few years older than me and he's already fantastic. 
and my voice is no good, and I'm not as good as Al Michaels, and, and maybe I should major in philosophy. <laughs> but the, the voice got a little better as we went along. How long did you play? Did any other sports even interest you as a kid? Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I wasn't that much of a hockey guy, although ironically, my first job for which I was paid was minor league hockey in Syracuse for 30 bucks a game and $5 a day meal money on the road in the old Eastern Hockey League, which is the league that the Paul Newman movie Slapshot is based on. And it was every bit as crazy as the movie makes it seem. But as a kid, baseball, football, basketball, I followed all of them avidly. Um, and I played all of them. I didn't play. Well, actually, we played tackle football without any equipment in a schoolyard. All kids did then. You know, parents weren't like helicopter parents. You know, in the summertime, you just hopped on your bike and they said, be back in time for dinner. You disappeared. You did whatever you did. No one had a cell phone. They didn't call like six other kids' parents to say, watch Mikey. You just disappeared. So we, we actually played, and I was always one of the smallest kids. We'd play tackle football on a lawn someplace with no equipment, you know. But I was never good enough to make or big enough to make the uh, – the high school team, but I don't know, since you asked, I could, I could throw a spiral. I just couldn't throw it 40 or 50 yards. I could throw it like 25 yards, but I could throw a spiral. And if we went out now and shot free throws or played catch with a baseball, you would know that I was not the last guy picked in a schoolyard game or I wasn't in right field picking four leaf clovers, but I just play along because the visual is interesting. Back when I did the NBA, if Shaquille O'Neal is up here and I'm down here, I, I understand it's a funny visual. So, so I just play along. That brings us to our alma mater, Syracuse University. How was your time there? Did you have any special mentors that you remember? Yes. Uh, he has since passed away, but there was a professor at Newhouse named Stan Alton. And he saw in me more than I saw in myself at that early stage. I guess he had seen a lot of students come through, many of whom were aspiring broadcasters. And even if I was an unfinished product, he saw potential and he took a liking to me and he would review my tapes with me. And we became so close that even after I was at NBC and doing pretty well at NBC, he felt entitled and I appreciated it to call me and say, well, you did this well, but you could have done better with that. So he was still mentoring me uh, all the way to when I was hosting the Olympics or the Super Bowl or calling the NBA finals. Um, so he was he was very important. But you know what else was important? And I'm sure it was true of you, Tim. You may have been the best on your squad, but your teammates and your coaches, but your teammates, they're part of your maturation as a player in one way or another. And the young people that were part of the Newhouse School and at WAER, we were all like-minded. We came to Syracuse for that reason. And we encouraged each other. We critiqued each other. Um, just as we're talking, I didn't answer it, but there was a call uh, from my college roommate. Um, he, you know, we've stayed close. Uh, some of them went on to great success. Um, t talking about my contemporaries there uh, and their lifelong friendships. And I was part of, I guess, the second wave at Syracuse, maybe the third, because the great Marty Glickman was first, played football, ran track, played basketball in the 30s at Syracuse, and then was part of the U.S. Olympic team in 1936, teammate of Jesse Owens um, on the U.S. relay team. Um, and then he went on to become really the first truly accomplished jock turned broadcaster. And he wasn't an analyst. He was a play by play man, practically invented how uh, basketball is called on the radio and then was a mentor to all of us, such a, a generous and, and giving guy. So Marty actually came first. And then after that, then you start to get Marv Albert and Dick Stockton and Len Berman and Andy Musser. And then I came along and then pretty soon it became kind of established. Syracuse is the cradle of sports broadcasters. And then it became a torrent. Then came Sean McDonough. And then came Mike Tirico. And then came Ian Eagle. And Ian's son, Noah Eagle. And it's endless. You know, people come up to me all the time. And their conversational icebreaker is, Bob, I went to Syracuse. And half the time, it turns out they went to Newhouse. Your career took off before you even finished your degree. 
What do you think gave you the confidence to cast yourself into the open market? <laughs> I, I don't know how much confidence I had. Maybe it was just gall or maybe it was just, you know, they put the dice in your hand. You might as well throw them. So I'm at Syracuse entering my senior year and thinking I'm going to get my degree along with all the people who entered as freshmen when I did. And then I got the job doing minor league hockey and I cut back from 15 credits to nine. So I did nine and nine and I thought I'd come back for one more semester in the fall of 74. And I got a job in St. Louis out of the blue at KMOX, big 50,000 watt station. And I think Tim, that you worked for a while with Joe Buck uh, and Joe, the son of the great Jack Buck, who was the sports director at KMOX. And KMOX gave birth to so many legendary sports broadcasters. Joe Garagiola, Harry Carey, Jack Buck, Dan Deardorff, Gary Bender, um, and now Joe Buck. And I was lucky enough to land there when I was 22 years old. And the first thing that Jack Buck said to me was, I have ties older than you, kid. So I don't know how encouraging that was, but that was just kind of his sarcastic sense of humor. And I, w I thought I was in over my head doing minor league hockey and games in Johnstown, Pennsylvania and Lewiston, Maine. Now I think I'm really in over my head. I'm 22 years old and Jack Buck is walking down the hallway. And unlike Joe Buck, who grew up around it and absorbed a lot of it, I loved sports, but I hadn't been in that circle like Joe had. So he was way ahead of me at a, at a comparable age. But, you know, when you get that kind of an opportunity, you just fake it until you figure it out. I guess that's what I did. Did you apply there or, or did they call just call you after seeing you on something? Here's what happened. The guy who called me a moment ago, Roger Holstein, had a cousin – guy named Harry Weltman, who was the president of the Spirits of St. Louis. They had been the Carolina Cougars. They moved from Carolina to St. Louis. The team existed for only the last two years of the ABA. Four teams got absorbed, the Pacers, the Nets, the Nuggets, and the Spurs, and everyone else went away, including the Spirits. Mm -hmm. But he went, even though he had other ambitions in his life, and he was very successful, he actually started WebMD. Uh, and wow. then sold it for a gazillion dollars. And now he does whatever he wants to do. I don't know what he was calling <laughs> me about, but it had to be something good. Anyway, um, he loved basketball. Uh, and so he just, as a lark, he said, I'll work for this team. My, my cousin's the president of the team. I'll work for the team in their like, public relations department. I'll have fun. And then he says, do you have an announcer? And they say, no, we're looking for one. And he says, I'm going to call my, my roommate. So he calls me. And he says, look, I think I can, I, I don't know if I can get you the job, but I can make sure your tape is heard. So I take a tape of a game I'd done between Syracuse and Rutgers as a sophomore on the campus station. And I listen to it, and it's pretty good. It's not perfect. But I edit out all the kind of choppy parts, and I re-edit it together, taking out any reference to the score that would have made it seem non-sequential. So I got Syracuse with the ball, Rutgers with the ball. <laughs> and then I had a guy who was more savvy than me technically, re-recorded for me with the bass slightly up and the treble slightly down. So I sounded older and more authoritative. And then I sent it to my buddy, Roger Holstein. Now this was KMOX, and I was told they had some 200 applicants that either went straight to KMOX or to the team's offices. But here's what Roger did. Harry Weltman goes out to lunch, and Roger took, it wasn't simple. You didn't send someone a link like you do now. It's a big reel-to-reel -reel thing on a woolen sack tape recorder that weighs about 50 pounds. And he put it on Harry's desk and he queued it up. And when Harry came walking back into the office, he said, listen to this, boom. And Harry said, hey, this guy's good. Take that over to KMOX, let Jack Buck hear it. And they narrowed it down to three and I was one of them. And they brought me in for an interview and I was pretty sure, you know, I'm 22, I look like I was 15 max. There is no way in the world they're going to hire me, but this is a good experience, I guess, to come in for the interview. And maybe because I was willing to work cheap, they hired me for $11,000 a year. And that was for year-round work, not just for calling the Spirits games. But I would have paid them 11000 if I had it, which I didn't. Um, and one thing kind of led to another, and everything fell into place from there. 
I'm not sure how many of the other 200 tapes got listened to, so maybe that wasn't really fair, but Roger gave me a leg up. <laughs> it all worked out. Yeah. yeah. You have had such a rich and diverse career. What are some of your proudest professional moments? You know, there's a few that I tend to cite. Um, when a big moment happens, especially on television, because you don't have to fully describe it, you have to frame it and put the appropriate caption beneath it. And you hope you don't mess it up. When Muhammad Ali lit the torch at the Atlanta Olympics in 1996, Dick Enberg and I were hosting the opening ceremony and we didn't know who it was going to be. About a dozen people knew. They rehearsed it one time at three o'clock in the morning, uh, a couple of days before the opening ceremony. And people were skeptical about Muhammad being able to do it because even then, 20 years before his death, the effects of Parkinson's were evident. And he dropped the torch, I found out later, during the rehearsal at three o'clock in the morning. Dick Ebersole, who ran NBC Sports, and it was his idea to have Muhammad uh, be the final torchbearer. And some of the people in Atlanta in the organizing committee said, you know, he may be a hero to some of you, but to us down south, he's still a draft dodger. And Dick said, no, no, most of the country has come around. This will be good if we can pull it off. And Dick Ebersol said to me and Dick Enberg, I'm not going to tell you who it is. I want your reaction to be as spontaneous as everyone in the stadium and everyone watching on television. And so I'm running through my mind, who could it be? Hank Aaron? Atlanta, yes, but not Olympics. Evander Holyfield? Atlanta, yes, maybe not quite. And I was stumped. And when Muhammad literally stepped out of the shadows, and took the torch, Dick Enberg said his signature thing, which was appropriate, oh my, that was always his exclamation. He said, the greatest, oh my. And whatever I said um, still holds up pretty well, and it was whatever occurred to me in the moment. Same thing with Michael Jordan's last shot to win the title in 98 for the Bulls uh, over the, the Jazz. I was working with Isaiah Thomas and Doug Collins, and they both did an excellent job of analyzing what was happening in that sequence toward the end of the game. But I felt like my job was to look a little bit beyond that, not to do something better, but just to do something different, because I knew that this wasn't just going to be on the front page of Sports Illustrated. It'd be in Time and Newsweek, because Jordan and the Bulls dynasty were that transcendent. And so... What I said kind of tried to frame Jordan's significance and the Bulls dynasty. And I think the last thing I said, luckily over a perfect slow motion replay, just as the ball swished through the net, if that's the last image of Michael Jordan, how magnificent is it? Um, and that, that holds up. When I watched the last dance, like half the world did, no sports going on during COVID, and that's when the last dance landed. Um, 20 plus years later, I had, I didn't remember 90% of what I said during that season, but the last part does hold up uh, and you're always hoping that that will be the case. Um, and in that, in that case it was, um, you know, there's, there's a few others when Muhammad Ali died, NBC asked me to do, uh, a remembrance of him, which, which I did. And it's knocking around on YouTube. I'm sure there's a few things on YouTube I'd rather erase. <laughs> when you do hundreds, if not thousands of things, you're going to mess up now and then. But, uh, you know, there, there's a few that can survive in the time capsule, I guess. Do you have any that are non, uh, not as famous, but a personal favorite? <sighs> um, well, you know, I did a late night show that wasn't sports. Uh, I did later from the late 80s to the mid 90s. And it's kind of a regret that I left it when I did, but I, I had so much going on, so much professionally on my plate, and my kids were young, and I was commuting between St. Louis and New York, and something had to come off the plate, and there was a lot of preparation. But now that hundreds of them are on YouTube, and I'm reminded of some of what we did, and I say we because even though I was the only one other than the guest on camera, the producers and researchers did a tremendous job with the show. But there were a number of those interviews just because of the nature of the show. 1.30 in the morning, no bells and whistles, only rarely a studio audience. It was just a different kind of conversation and the kind of conversation you hardly ever see. 
on television anymore where everything mm -hmm. is sound bites and clickbait and whatnot. This was, I hope, a more thoughtful conversation. And, and very often it showed the guest good advantage. And I guess it, it, I guess I did a decent enough job as an interviewer that a lot of that stuff, like some of the sports stuff, holds up 20, 30 years later. I'll give you one. Uh, you wanted a specific, okay? Um, <laughs> Paul McCartney did the show in 1991, I think. And now you see Paul much more often. The world is different. you got all these entertainment shows and everyone seems to pop up uh, frequently. But then he hadn't done a U.S. interview in about 10 years. And musicians, ball players aspiring actors and actresses who are working as waiters and waitresses. They keep odd hours. They stay up late. And so McCartney, like Paul Simon, like John Mellencamp, uh, like others, like Bob Seger and, and Smokey Robinson, they knew about the show before they were ever on because they're night owls. So McCartney agrees to do the show. And some people think of it, and this was mostly because of him, not me. He was just great. Uh, think of it as maybe the best McCartney interview that they've seen. And then you had moments like this one. Mary Lou Henner, who then was very famous for her role on Taxi, a very outgoing, bubbly uh, performer. And she has this facility, I forget what the technical name of it is, but she remembers every day of her life in explicit detail. Or if you say to her, uh, January 23rd, 1978, she says, oh, that was a Tuesday. And it, and it was. She has that crazy savant thing going on. So mm -hmm. when I learned that through the research, I asked her a few uh, random dates. And she said, oh, I was in the sixth grade and I was sitting next to, you know, Sally Jones. And Sally and I got along pretty well. But then when we were older, we wanted to have the same boy as our boyfriend. And then we weren't friends anymore. OK, so it was that stuff. It's fine. But how could you really check it? So then I started asking her about dates that everybody remembers where they are or were. And I said, okay, July 20th, 1969. That's when men first walked on the moon. And she goes, who told you this? And I said, no one told me anything. I just picked it at random. She says, okay. And she starts to answer. And then she says like three or four times, who told you this? And I keep reassuring her. I just picked it at random. And then she goes, all right. And she starts twirling her hair with her finger, you know, the sign of anxiety <laughs> and nervousness. And she's looking at me in this coquettish way. And she says, that's the night I lost my virginity. And I say, <laughs> oh well, one thing we know for sure, Neil Armstrong wasn't the guy. And then so she laughs, right? And then without any prompting, you know, the, the stage manager's laughing, the cameramen are laughing, she's nervously laughing, I'm laughing. And then I didn't ask her any second question. After the laughter subsides, she goes, standing up in the shower. This is more detail than I was looking for. <laughs> and I say, well, you know, Mary Lou, I tend to think this is the sort of thing all of us would remember, even if we didn't have this special ability that you have to recall everything, that would be something that would stand out in our memories no matter what. Okay, for a long time, on every July 20th, once I got a cell phone, I would send a text to Mary Lou Henner. Happy Neil Armstrong Day and happy whatever day for you. And we've gotten together a few times since. And she, she tells me, this is like, you know, 30 years later. She says that she's still among whatever her acting credits are, that strangers will sometimes come up to her and say, so where were you when men walked on the moon? <laughs> so there you go. That's hilarious. What are the odds of that? Pretty slim. <laughs> Bob, I think that you have probably told this more times than you care to already, but can you recount for us the story of how and why O.J. Simpson called you from his infamous drive down the Los Angeles freeway in a white Bronco with a gun to his head? Yeah, Tim, that is uh, an interesting story. Uh, almost unbelievable, except it's true. It's game five of the 1994 NBA Finals, Rockets and Knicks at Madison Square Garden. And it's the day that um, 
they officially put out a warrant for OJ's arrest. Um, and it, it's clear that they're going to charge him with the murder of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. Now, once this Bronco chase, this slow p- speed chase down the 405 begins to unfold, virtually every other network and cable outlet carried it in its entirety. But Dick Ebersole at NBC had a different decision to make because this is game five of a closely contested NBA final with a huge audience. On the other hand, you can't ignore something that people still talk about, which is this Bronco chase. So I'm the host. Marv Albert's calling it. Tom Brokaw's back at NBC News at 30 Rockefeller Plaza. And I'm passing the ball, in effect, between Marv and Tom from time to time. A timeout. Marv throws it to me. I throw it to Tom. I transition it back to Marv. Sometimes there's a split screen. So you got Ewing and Elijah Wan going at it over here and the Bronco moving at slow speed down the 405 over there. And as this develops, we hear because Tom Lang, the police detective, is talking to him. And A.C. Cowlings, who's driving the Bronco, is saying O.J. has a gun to his head. Um, and you don't know what's going to happen. We know what did happen. But as it's unfolding, you don't know if he's really going to kill himself or once he gets to his house in Brentwood and gets out of the driveway, will he give up peacefully, which he did, or will he be gunplay? No one knows. On the other hand, a good portion of the country wants to see the Knicks and the Rockets. So the difficult thing there or the challenge there wasn't content, it was tone. Because you couldn't act completely somber because right behind you is a packed Madison Square Garden yelling and screaming, and some people watching are invested in the game. On the other hand, if you sounded too invested in the game, you wouldn't be mindful that this was something, with all due respect to the NBA, that people would be talking about much longer than they're talking about this. So you're trying to thread that needle, and that's that was kind of my role. So a few days later, the series goes back to Houston, and between games six and seven, uh, there was a three-day wait, and I'm just sitting around the hotel, and the phone rings, and it's a woman from Time Magazine. And she says, we hear OJ tried to call you from the back of the Bronco. And I'm thinking, this is ridiculous. And I said, no, no truth to that at all. I think I'm telling the truth at the time. Conversation lasts less than a minute. Now fast forward four months, and OJ has asked me through intermediaries to visit when I'm in L.A. So I do. So I visit him at the L.A. County Jail. Robert Kardashian picks me up at the hotel, and it's me Kardashian, A.C. Cowlings, visiting with O.J. And after some awkward small talk, you know, he's in a blue prison jumpsuit, shackled both wrists, both ankles. They take one of the ankle things off and attach it to the chair. Like, where's he going to go? But I guess that's prison protocol. And after some awkward opening exchanges, A.C. just says, you know, we tried to call you from the back of the Bronco. And I'm like, what? And all of a sudden I'm thinking, oh, now I'm thinking about the lady from Time Magazine. She was on to something. So OJ says, yeah, we called your house in St. Louis. There's no one there, right? And then he tells me he called the studio. And the studio from which we did the NFL show, which OJ and I hosted together, was the same where we did the NBA show, except in the finals, we're not there. We're at the site. We're at Madison Square Garden. And apparently he tried several times. And on one of those tries, an engineer, a tech, answered the phone. I got to speak to Bob Costas. He's not here. Got to speak to him. Well, he's not here. Who's calling? O.J. Simpson. Yeah, right. Click. And the guy hangs up. Now, I would have doubted that story, except a few years after that, the tech himself acknowledged to me that it happened, and that he was the guy who answered the phone and thought it was a bunch of BS and hung up on O.J. Simpson. So I then say to OJ, as anyone would, why in that moment would you be calling me? And he said, this was the way OJ spoke, they were dogging me, Bob. Well, I guess so, you're in jail. They, they were dogging me. And his point was not so much about the murders, but as the stories began to come out about domestic violence or whatever, that the media was very hard on him and his reputation was being destroyed. And he named some particular people who I won't name here because it's not really their fault. But he thought that they were giving him a hard time. And somehow in that crazed moment, um, when his whole life has been turned upside down um, and he's got a gun to his head, at least according to AC, he thinks that if he can reach me, 
that I can act as kind of an on-air character witness. Um, I don't think he really thought that through because even though he and I were friends, maybe not close friends, but certainly friendly colleagues and friendly acquaintances, if somehow he'd gotten through to me and if we had gone on the air, I would have had to have asked him some very pointed questions. I'm not sure how he would have answered them. And then the other half would have been to do the same thing that the police detective was doing, try to talk him out of it. Put the gun down. Think about your kids. Think about your family. If you're innocent, you'll get good representation. You got good representation, even if he wasn't innocent, as it turned out. But, you know, don't do it. Don't do it. Put the gun down. Give up. And it would have been incredible television, obviously, but it never happened. In 2017, at a roundtable discussion at the University of Maryland, you predicted the decline of the NFL because of the repeated concussions that were destroying people's brains. This created a backlash that ended your 40-year run with NBC Sports. Do you believe that the NFL blackballed you? Well, as to the first part, I probably overstated the risk, not to the players, but to the NFL as an institution, we see that even as many members of the media, many players themselves, the league itself has acknowledged it, and the fans, if they're paying any attention, are aware of it, football still reigns supreme over all other sports and over all other forms of entertainment. It's the one thing that survived all the changes in media and all the platforms and everything. Football still cuts through. If you look at the top 100 rated television programs in any given year, 85 or 90 of them are NFL games. So uh, my dire prediction about the NFL was not on the money. I didn't think it was going to go away, but I thought there would be a measurable decline in its popularity. Didn't turn out that way. But I think that in a small way, what I did, what Alan Schwartz, uh, who either won or was nominated for a Pulitzer for his series about head trauma, in football in general, and the NFL in particular, and what others did. Um, Chris Nowitzki at the Concussion Legacy Institute. I think all of that put pressure on the NFL. They were certainly concerned about the pipeline, about youth football, and moms and dads saying, hey, we're football fans. We're not going to let our son play football. And that concern translated into action. As you know, Tim, you can never make football completely safe, but you can make it less dangerous through awareness. And so the concussion protocols changed. Um, the, there's a, a movement to improve equipment. They're constantly updating uh, the quality of, of helmets. Uh, there have been rules changes that make sense. The playing surface matters. A lot of concussions take place not because of helmet or body to helmet contact, but because of helmet or head contact with the surface. And if the surface is is unforgiving, then that's a that's perilous too. So I think that those of us who help to bring that to attention actually help to bring about some reform. Uh, was it my intention, and I couldn't have done it anyway, to destroy football? Of course not. You know, many of the best people, including yourself, that I've met through football are among the best people I've met in all the sports. Players, broadcasters, coaches, administrators. And I don't deny the excitement, the drama, the strategy, the shared experience. All that stuff is great. But you also can't deny that there's something about the basic nature of the game that had to be addressed and will always be a concern. And I think we're in a better place now than we were certainly a generation ago and even than we were in 2017. Now, did that lead to me leaving NBC? Yeah, it did. And it was a 40-year relationship that was 95% wonderful and mutually beneficial. Uh, and I look back on it almost with almost entirely appreciation and gratitude. But uh, at that point, I had stepped away by my own design from hosting the Olympics and from hosting Sunday Night Football. That was part of the agreement when I signed my last contract and I'd entered an emeritus stage. And so it was easier then for NBC to say, hey, he isn't worth the trouble. He's more of an annoyance than an asset here. I'm sure 
that while Roger Goodell and company are always very polite and gracious to me, and it continues to be the case if our paths cross, I'm sure they weren't pleased to hear that coming from somebody who was the host of, of a lot of their stuff and until that point had been the host of the Super Bowl when it was on NBC. So I, I get that. And, um, you know, the, the NFL is an indispensable business partner of the major networks in which they invest billions of dollars. And I guess, you know, I, I, it's understandable to me. I, they had their prerogatives. I had mine. I'm comfortable with what I said. Uh, I don't regret it. Uh, I don't like it when people misrepresent what I said. I just tried to give you a more nuanced version of it, which is what I, I really said and what I really felt. And I don't like it when people who don't know anything at all, which is a lot of stuff on the Internet, say, oh, they fired him because of this or that. No, we, we mutually decided to part company because we'd reached a point of diminishing returns. But the personal relationships are all Bob, when you when you said that in 2017, um, I agree with you that now today the game is safer, significantly safer than it was. Mm -hmm. That I don't even think you can really even compare it to the the 80s and 90s when my dad was playing. But do you think from 2017 to to 2024, do you think the the progress I guess has been enough? I, it's still I still agree with what you're saying about no matter what you do, I mean football is inherently mm -hmm. risky. Yeah. I don't know if it's ever enough. They have to remain vigilant, but it's much better. And, you know, the DeMar Hamlin incident was misunderstood by a lot of people. And I tried. I was on CNN a lot as that unfolded because it happened on Monday Night Football. So a huge portion of the nation saw it. And it became a subject of fascination, not just to avid football fans, but to people in general. And the point I tried to make was there are a lot of valid observations to make about the dangers of football, but the DeMar Hamlin thing is not one of them. Uh, that was, that myocard, myocarditis is just the, the flukiest thing. By a millisecond in the, the cardiac cycle, some kind of contact has to happen. That was a routine tackle, the kind of tackle that happens when you take into account all levels of football millions of times a year. And it's actually, rare as it is to begin with, more likely to happen in a girls' softball game or in a lacrosse or hockey game with so-called projectile sports where the ball or the puck might strike you there. So football is not to be blamed for the DeMar Hamlin situation. But on the other hand, what it pointed up was how football should be applauded, at least at the NFL level, for how alert they are to any medical emergency. If that had happened in a high school football game somewhere, the kid might very well have died on the field. But they had top flight medical facilities right there, an ambulance right there. This is an old school training staff that says, you know, how many fingers am I holding up and I'll tape your ankles, you know? The, these, these were people who were versed in this sort of thing. And it yeah. turns out that all of the personnel had gone through rehearsals, unlikely as it might be, for a moment like this. And they got him to a top flight hospital that luckily was only a couple of miles away. If you didn't have that level of expertise and that level of training available, DeMar Hamlin might not be alive today. So I think actually that was an incident that was misunderstood. That's not an example of the dangers of football. It is an example of what a good job the NFL has done and maybe at the Division I level many colleges have done to be as vigilant as they can and prepared as they can to respond to any emergency that takes place. But I'm not so sure that a high school football game in Podunk is going to have that that level uh, of, uh, you know, but most high schools, I think they found out they, they did some kind of investigative work. Uh, they didn't have defibrillators available. Or if they did, in one case, it was locked like in the gym teacher's office and it was a Saturday and the guy wasn't there. You know, I think that incident, as high profile as it was, probably put everybody on alert. Can they have the degree of personnel and wherewithal that the NFL has? No, but almost every place where contact sports have, are played, you ought to have at least a minimum level of ability to respond. And the people involved, the coaches, the training staff, they should be better prepared than they have been previously, and it's probably a better situation now. 
the the trainer that was the first one to get to Demar in the field is a Syracuse guy. I don't know if you know that. I didn't know that until now. He was the, he was the trainer at uh, for the Syracuse football team when I was there. His name's Wow. Danny. Yeah, uh, that's something to be proud of. Yeah, yeah. He went from he was at the Syracuse football athletics trainer, and then he went to the Bills, and then I, all of a sudden I'm watching the game. I mean, everyone was talking about it. I wasn't watching the game when it happened, but I mm-hmm. some, somebody called me. I was like, "You got to turn on the TV." And I saw, you know, all of a sudden I see Denny out there, but another Syracuse connection. Well, another reason to be proudly orange. <laughs> That's right. I'm going to send you, Bob, I'm going to send you a link to, uh, we actually did an episode with Joe Buck. Uh-huh. And I think you'd like it because he talks about his dad a lot. And my dad, uh, Jack Buck used to call Joe and my dad and give them tips because they were, that was his first broadcast partner was Joe Buck. Uh-huh. And Jack would call him after the game. I remember having dinner with your dad and Joe in St. Louis sometime in the mid nineties. And it wasn't that long after the whole OJ thing. And I'd never mentioned any of this stuff publicly. No one knew about the the phone call from the Bronco and the visit um, in jail until they started doing like 10 year anniversary of it, 20 year anniversary of these documentaries. And then people asked me, that's when the thing became publicly known. But I remember telling Tim and Joe about both the phone call and the visit uh, to the L.A. County Jail, which was pretty much fresh in my mind because it was probably around 1995, 96, somewhere in there. No later than 97. Oh, that's hilarious. I'm living proof of what you said about football, but I do appreciate the NFL's response by making the game safer for the players today. Yeah, I can understand that. Um, I haven't spoken with you until now directly about this. There's obviously a connection in some cases between contact sports, football specifically in this case, and ALS, but not always, because obviously there are people with ALS who never played contact sports. Do you believe and do your doctors believe that your circumstances connected to football? Yeah, his – so so – the split is about roughly 90% of people have what they call sporadic ALS and 10% have it through genetics. Mm-hmm. And so my dad doesn't have anything in his, his genetics and um, his doctors determined that it was from the uh, repetitive head collisions. Hell Which, of a price to pay. Yeah. The funny thing about it, Bob, is my dad, when he talks about it, he's like, I'd go back and do the whole thing over again. I think I'm, Actually, I don't think I know. I'm more bitter than he is about the whole thing. Uh, I, I, my viewership of football uh, went down 99% after, I don't know, 2016, somewhere around, actually yeah. 2016, 2017, somewhere in there. But he's, we, I only watched the, we watched the Falcons games together, my dad's old team, obviously. We watched yeah. the Falcons game with my, uh, my dad and my, my two brothers. And sometimes my whole family will come in, my sisters, and, and that's fun. But, yeah, I don't I, – I can't enjoy it like I used to anymore. Yeah, I, I can understand that. Obviously, I haven't been directly impacted. Uh, leaving NBC is a blip on the on the radar screen and on the whole story of my life, so it's not the same thing. But my connection to it is diminished. People ask me. I still watch it, but I don't build a Sunday or a Monday around it. Yeah. So, you know, if I tune into a game, especially if it's the fourth quarter – I like the you know clock management part of it. I find that yeah. interesting. And I don't have to know every player on every team the way I used to or nearly every player. I can tap into it. You know, I know the basic rules. I know the dynamics of the game. So I, yeah. I but I, I got to the point where I felt I could no longer in good conscience be the presenter of it. And what I wanted to do on that last Super Bowl uh, that they decided, and I understood their reasoning, they decided that I wasn't the person to host it. I wanted to interview Roger Goodell, not just about this, but about all the issues that the NFL faced. And I said, I'm willing to host it if you let me interview Goodell. And then Goodell said no. And again, I, I like Roger Goodell. I, he That's his prerogative. But when I couldn't do that, you know, I just didn't feel like being the master of ceremonies anymore. Um, but that doesn't mean that I don't appreciate, you know, my friendships with Peyton Manning or Tom Brady or your dad. I mean, I, I do. It's a, like everything. There's layers to it. It's 
it's yeah. complex, but your family understands this part of it more than most of us, myself included, do. Yeah, and there's a there's a beauty to football too that if you understand the game, and you mentioned earlier the strategy and clock mm-hmm. management, and you know, I had a an old football coach, his name is George O'Leary, and he said every game, like he watches football, he said about there's about four plays a game where a coach it's fourth and one and you're on the other team 42 yard line and you need the coach needs to make a decision and he said that's he watches the entire game for those moments uh-huh. because because that's the beauty of football when do you roll the dice do you not do you punt do you go for the long field goal do you anyways it was just uh yeah i used to love the big hits now when i watch i cringe at the big hits but i do love the the art of football yeah the the chess match of I'll give you another side antidote when my dad's typing. Okay. Uh, my Joe Buck said that when him and my dad were calling games, Jack Buck would call him after the game and he'd say, Joe, you got to do this different and tell Tim to make the point once. Don't keep making the same point. Make the point and move <laughs> on. <laughs> it sounded like uh, you had a similar experiences with him as being uh, tough but uh, very, um, I guess, he, fair. I don't know. He had that gravelly voice. Yeah. Um, you know, he was like from the World War II and Depression era America. Uh, he had kind of a, a rat pack sensibility, like a Sinatra type, you know, type. That, that was his world. Um, and But he had a heart. Goal. He was very sentimental and he was very, you know, kind of kind of could be that that sarcastic guy on, on the outside. He had a terrific sense of humor and a great, great broadcaster. But there's the stories of him and his generosity and kindness to people and work with charities around St. Louis are legion. And it's a, fam- a famous story. Um, he was at some eatery in St. Louis and everyone knew him in St. Louis uh, mm-hmm. and, and loved him. And so the kid, you know, probably working his way through college or whatever, parks the car. And Buck looks for the tip and he only has hundreds and he gives the kid the hundred and the kid says, Mr. Buck, that's the biggest tip I've ever gotten. And he says, and Jack says, what was the biggest tip you got before this? And he said, $50. And he said, who gave you that? He said, you did, Mr. Buck. <laughs> that's Which awesome. Which he would tell as a joke, but you know, it's just that that's just who he was. He was a pay it forward guy. And yeah. he had such an influence um, you know, so many sports broadcasters came out of St. Louis, but he was at the top of that mountain for all of us. And everyone has a different style. Like I didn't copy Jack Buck's style, but what all of us copied, even if we couldn't match it, tried to copy was his generosity and using your, your visibility for something worthwhile. You know, celebrity is kind of an empty value. But if people recognize and appreciate you, and you can turn that into something good. Jack was such a special person. Well, you know, this funny thing about sports and entertainment, you, know, you could never believe that it's the be all and end all, but it does give you an avenue um, to reach people who person A that knows who you are or likes what you do might have nothing in common with person B. But mm-hmm. sports is what they have in common. You know, you go to a ball game yeah. in St. Louis, and people have different political points of view. They have different life and job experiences, but they're all rooting for the Cardinals. You know, and Jack Buck for generations was the guy who brought them the Cardinal game. So that's a, a special connection. And anyone that's lucky enough to be in a position like that, and they can put a smile on somebody's face with very little effort of their own, that's an opportunity you shouldn't waste. Yeah, that's another thing about sports, right? Just the camaraderie of it all. It's such yeah. a unifier. Yeah. And in a and I think the more divisive the country gets, it makes it that much more noticeable when everybody gets together about something. As silly as a as a bunch of people yeah. playing a game, it still brings together, you know, to your point. Yeah, and you know, that's why um I understand um some people who say to someone like me, because I've had a crossover career and sometimes I'm on a show like Bill Maher or whatever, and they'll ask me questions that aren't related to sports. 
And sometimes when people say stick to sports, what they're really saying is, I don't want you to say anything I don't agree with. <laughs> we would be happy to have you on on Fox News if you were saying what we want you to say. But yeah. some other people will say, stick to sports just because I don't want the political stuff to enter my head while I'm watching sports and while I'm watching you. And mm -hmm. I understand that. I don't know if it would make me, it certainly wouldn't make me change my point of view. Um, but I understand that. I understand that when, when you step into a different lane, I don't buy this, like, stay in your lane. Why should I yeah. have to have one lane? You know, I, I did a yeah. lot of non-sports stuff at NBC. And I was offered a lot of, a lot of broadcasting opportunities that had nothing to do with sports. And I hope that I've experienced and read about a lot outside sports because i think the, the broader your frame of reference the better you are as a sports broadcaster or, or at anything else you do so i don't think you should be confined to one lane stay in your lane um but i i do understand why some people find it jarring if someone they associate with a even a little bit wanders into not wanders ventures into b yeah, I get it. I'm not saying that's I'm going to change. I'm just saying I get it. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective. No, I've I've always heard people say, it, and I'm I'm kind of like how you are. I'm like, give me a break. You know, like yeah. well, anyone can say anything. That's that's the beauty of. But yeah, it's. I like and a that. lot of times when people say stick to sports or whatever, it's because they don't want to deal with the merit of what you're saying. It's just a yeah. way of discounting what you're saying <laughs> rather than have to engage <laughs> with the point. Just going back for a second, we're very good friends with Roger. I appreciate both the safety he brought to the game as commissioner and just him as a friend on a personal level. Well, I, I think Roger is a good man. My sense of it is that he's a good person. He obviously has a corporate position and he has to protect both the business interests and the image, which are connected, of the NFL. Uh, but I think generally speaking, I think his heart is in the right place. You know, I don't know if you know this, Tim, but I've done a fair amount of, I wouldn't call it work, but appearances connected to ALS, most of it in New York with the uh, New York chapter of the ALS Foundation. Uh, a friend of mine who lived into his mid-90s, passed away a few years ago, named Ray Robinson, was Lou Gehrig's first biographer. As a teenager, he was actually in Yankee Stadium when Lou Gehrig delivered his luckiest man speech in 1939. And so Robinson, after Lou Gehrig had passed, Robinson wrote a biography of Lou Gehrig. And he became friends with Teresa Wright, who played Eleanor Gehrig in Pride of the Yankees, the Lou Gehrig biopic starring Gary Cooper. And he became friends with Gary Cooper's daughter, and so it was a natural thing for Ray Robinson to become connected to the ALS Foundation. And 20, 25 years ago, he asked me if I would MC uh, their annual event. And I did probably 10, 12 times. Um, and if I'm in New York, it's usually held in November. I always go to the event and I became friends with, with many of the ALS families still in touch with them. Um, and they would bring a, a significant sports figure to be Chris Everett or Derek Jeter or something like that would be the honoree each year. And, uh, and I would be one of the hosts, if not the only host. Um, and so it, you know, it increased my understanding of it. I would, I wouldn't presume to say that I understand it completely. Um, and those of us who are not directly affected can tap into it and then, step away from it, um, whereas those who are affected live with it 24-7. Um, I understand that, uh, but, but I, I think I've, I've gotten a, a greater respect and appreciation and understanding of what not just those who have ALS, but those who love them and care for them, their family, the impact that it has. And I hope it isn't um, presumptuous of me to say 
Tim when I look at you or Troy when I look at your dad. This is one of the most accomplished people. And, you know, I'm not going to overstate it. Tim and I were at Syracuse at different times. We're acquaintances. We're never close friends. But here's a person who's immensely intelligent, had, you know, had everything, athletic ability, movie star good looks, intelligence, talent, accomplished author, broadcaster, athlete, all those things, and respected by all his friends and a beautiful family. And now not just coping with with his own mortality, but also with his sense of himself. And I think it's just admirable to carry on as best you can. I recognize you, Tim. Not, not just your visage. I recognize the person, even if it's coming to me in a different way. Thank you for your time helping with the disease, but also your understanding. That's actually a good segue. I had one thing I wanted to ask you about, Bob. Sure. This, this is such a cool quote. So I was, uh, I was reading this article. Someone actually sent it to me. I didn't, I didn't uh -huh. even find it. Someone sent me this article from uh, the 1990s, and the, they asked you about my dad. And you said, quote, one is considered fortunate to be blessed with either brains or brawn. Tim Green has been blessed with both. <laughs> I just thought that was such a cool. I, I thought I thought that was a book blurb. I thought that was a blurb. Uh, maybe so, it was a blurb. I don't, it was in this uh, article from. Uh, yeah. I'll send I'll send you a copy of it. Someone sent it to me. I told them we were doing this podcast, and they said, "Oh, and they uh -huh. sent me that link." But I did I did say it, and it is true. <laughs> <laughs> I remember my my grandmother used to say, say to me, um, I don't know why she said this. I guess it was because I was so interested in sports and she had no interest in sports. So I'd be sitting there watching a baseball game. I'd be 11 years old. And she'd say, Bobby, be brainy, not brawny. And I'm sitting there <laughs> even 11 years old. You think I have a choice here? <laughs> I'm 11 years old. All the other kids are mostly bigger than me already. So I'm not, it's not like I'm going to turn my back on being brawny. I'm, I'm glad I'm reasonably brainy. That would appear to be my best avenue here, Grandma. We've had Dr. Julian Bales, Dr. Joseph Maroon, and Dr. Chris Nowinski on our podcast all of whom are linked closely with the early days of the discovery of CTE in the brains of Mike Webster and Andre Waters, just to name a few. And I wonder if you were in contact with any of these guys or where were you getting your information from that would compel you to make such a forceful statement about the future of football? Um, Chris Nowinski, yes. Uh, before that, uh, I mentioned earlier the articles that Alan Schwartz wrote uh, in the New York Times and, and other pieces, documentaries that I had seen. And then Anne McKee um, at uh, Boston University, where they've, they've done a lot of work in discovering CTE uh, and her colleagues there. And they're working on being able to uh, affirmatively identify it in living patients rather than through autopsies. But even without uh, the, the definitive proof there are certain cir circumstances in living people where you can clearly say this person has CTE, whether it's manifested itself uh, in ALS or in cognitive difficulties. Um, we're continuing to learn more about it, but the general outlines of, are clear. Bob, I didn't know anything about at all about ALS. I mean, nothing. Like mm. you said, you were at the, the ALS uh, charter doing doing MCing stuff. I didn't. I mean, I, I would see when the Falcons would play the Saints, and they would show Steve Gleason, and that yeah. was that was the extent of my ALS. And I knew the ice bucket challenge. Yeah. I never looked it up. I never nothing. I mean, knew nothing about it. And then uh, you know, now looking, it's it's such a profound impact on, like you said, not everyone's life. Everyone within a one or even two degree circle of my dad now knows so much about it. But it's uh, it's really cool yeah. you did the. The MC does events. That's awesome. Well, you know, there's also this, uh, and I, it's a natural impulse just because of the way human beings relate to each other. Um, but 
a person with ALS, as long as they're still here on this earth, the mind is is still there. The mind is there. Yeah. And we we tend, um, and we all should be more sensitive about this. You see someone in a wheelchair; they may not have ALS. You see someone who's their caregiver, giver, and some people tend to talk past that person to the caregiver as if it's a child. You know, mm-hmm. even if someone with ALS may labor to express themselves spontaneously, the thought that they will eventually express comes to them as quickly as it comes to you and me. You know, Mm -hmm. the ability to hear and process and think and feel is the same. We just have to be more patient um, in receiving the message. Yeah, you're. I've I've been trying to say that to people, and I don't know how to articulate. I, I'm not near the orator that you are, so I'm gonna I'm gonna have to uh, clip that and save it and show it to people now. When I instead of me trying to explain it, it is it is. Uh, and and you know, some people like walk up to my dad and be like, "Hi, Tim." You know, like talk like so loud, like you can't hear. Him. But right. it's not. They're, they're not doing it maliciously. No. They just don't. They just don't they just know. Don't know. They just they yeah. just don't know. You can't you can't blame them. But it must be frustrating, you know? Yeah. I try to just laugh. Most people just don't know. Anyways, having to end your 40-year relationship with NBC like that must have made you sick. But you're Bob Costas, so you could walk across the street and every single network would love to have you. You ended up doing just fine being able to work in baseball and with CNN giving your thoughts on current events, Um, but still, it must have been a low point. What I'm trying to get at here is your faith, because for obvious reasons, I have had to lean into my Christian faith like never before. And I'm curious what Bob Costas leans into at the rare low points in his life. That is a profound question. You know, I think I have enough perspective to realize that whatever the setbacks and um, maybe minor injustices that we all encounter, on the worst day of my life, I've been more fortunate than most people in my profession and most people overall. What bothered me and bothers me still a little bit about my departure from NBC was not leaving. Like people say to me, do you miss the Olympics? I'm happy that I did a dozen of them, but I did a, I did a dozen. And it was time by my own decision to step aside. Same thing with some of the other things. I did so many highly visible things for so long that I don't miss that kind of exposure. I'm happy doing what I'm doing now. And as long as it's done well, then I'm satisfied with that. But what what troubled me about my departure from NBC was that it didn't end as it should have on a grace note. It shouldn't have ended with that kind of friction and that kind of confusion. Really, the public doesn't understand what happened. And there's many versions, all of which are wrong, that are out there. Not that people are thinking about it years later. I'm thinking about it, A, because you asked me, and B, because it's my life. But I wish that that we had tied a ribbon around it in a way that was more mutually respectful and that reflected the quality of what we did together for four decades and how mutually beneficial it was and how much fun it was and how gratifying it was it's almost like you know and don't want to be overblown but you have a symphony and then somehow the last note is discordant and then the curtain comes down you know you just don't want it to to end that way you know do you think you could reach out to them and and mend it or not really maybe just do like one event there there have been overtures Uh, i won't go further than that because i'm not even sure exactly what form it will take but i think that that almost everybody realizes that um, there was a misplay here, that uh, whatever whatever disagreements we had, that is so minor. You know, a lifelong friendship, somebody you'd, you'd you know, do anything for. You might have disagreements. You might be angry with one another. That's the way it is in a marriage or whatever it might be. Uh, you don't want that to be the definition of it when there was so much good. And I think that both parties, everyone involved, there's multiple people involved. I think almost everybody recognizes that. 
and you know maybe there's maybe there's a way to uh, to have a, a kind of a uh, what's the word I'm looking for an addendum to it maybe that uh, that ends it on a on a more mutually appreciative note and that's the way it should be oh but you know your dad's question was about about faith and about perspective i i am not a conventionally religious person well but well i certainly respect other people's honest faith uh i am i think a spiritual person uh, i believe in things larger than ourselves beliefs and principles more important than our own individual needs. None of us are perfect, but I try as best I can uh, to at least strive toward my ideals. I think there are too many people in public life now. We're all imperfect, but there are people in public life who shall go nameless in this conversation who have trashed the whole idea of ideals. All that matters is partisanship and tribalism. What our guy did doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. He's our guy. I, I don't. I don't want to live in that kind of society. Like I said, we're all imperfect, but m- the vast majority of us are generally good people. I don't want to be led by someone, at least nominally, who is not generally a good person. People can infer from that whatever they want. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to come out and say it, but we can. <laughs> Bob, we have not talked about your family. You have a beautiful wife and two highly successful kids, one of which I read won an Emmy of her own on the other side of the camera. Yes. Um, you know, Wikipedia is not always 100% reliable. And it's true that my daughter Taylor did win an Emmy Award, but she has not been in broadcasting except for like, two months of her life because she wanted to say that she did something with her dad. And so she worked on the news desk uh, at the London Olympics in 2012. And the way it works on a big extravaganza type thing like that, if the network wins an overall Emmy award, they give Emmys to everyone involved. So there were hundreds of Emmys given out at the Olympics. And my daughter earned one of them by doing a good job in a novice position on the news desk, but she is uh, in education. She's in the process of getting a second master's now in education. Uh, She didn't want to go to Syracuse and neither did her brother Keith because they didn't want to hear about their dad all the time. Uh, So she went to Boston College, a Big East rival. uh, (laughs) If we go back a bit in time, she went to Boston College, She did very well, Phi Beta Kappa, and she got a master's degree in education at Columbia and she taught for 10 years, and now she's going back for a second master's, and we'll see what she does with that. Um, extremely well-read, kind of kid that would read for pleasure, not just to do her homework, but read for pleasure in the summertime when she was seven or eight years old. Um, and her brother is involved in broadcasting. Uh, he's been with the Major League Baseball Network almost since its inception, worked his way up from researcher to producer, and occasionally gets on the air in the off season. There's a, a morning show that's kind of a baseball today show called Hot Stove. And he researches and produces his own segments and presents them on the air, um, where he's pretty good and shows a, a good sense of humor, which he honed from the time he was very little by mocking his father. That was basically <laughs> what he did from the time that he was like five or six years old. It was like, Hey, yeah, you may think my dad's a big deal, but let me tell you what a bozo he is. That was kind of this kind of his deal. <laughs> Bob, one of the things that um, we like to do with every every guest we have on is we ask them. So, one of the things that was important to us is my dad is has a lot of different kind of career paths. Obviously, mm-hmm. you mentioned football and broadcasting and books, mm-hmm. and with the podcast, we wanted to make sure that we didn't get pigeonholed into one lane. We wanted to be, you know, have, have a, a very wide, um, very wide different you know, array of different uh, backgrounds and interests on the podcast. Really the only theme that, that sticks through every, every one of them is just, you know, interesting people with interesting stories. So I'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit. Who are a couple of people, you know, that you think we should have on the podcast? 
Boy, that is really interesting. You know, I didn't think through any of the questions you might possibly ask me. And even if I had, I'm not sure that would have been one of them. Ask me a few more questions while I think about that one. <laughs> See if I can come up with a decent answer. I don't want to disappoint you or your listeners. You know who's really an interesting subject, but he's been everywhere because he has a new book, is Bill Maher. Um, I like Bill because he's ticking off the left and the right. Yeah. By just he he's I wouldn't say he's a centrist. He's a classic liberal, but he's calling out stuff that makes no sense to him. He's staking out a common sense position. And sometimes that means, you know, kind of giving it to both sides of the aisle. Uh, that's a, a lame answer because it's such an obvious answer. I should have given <laughs> you a better answer than that. I'm going to get back to you. Now on to our final word segment, where we ask our guests a few rapid fire questions. What was the happiest moment in your life? The happiest moments in my life have involved my children. Um, my dad, as I mentioned earlier, never got to see anything I did. Uh, the first World Series game I called when I turned around and saw nine-year-old Keith Costas in the back of the booth. Um, that made me happy and also made me a little sad thinking about my own dad, as flawed as he might have been. You know, I wish that he could have seen the career I've been lucky enough to have. And my daughter, um, when she was little, you know, dad was sometimes away. We lived in St. Louis and then uh, I'd come back and she would know as the car came up the driveway uh, she'd come bursting out of the house and she had this big head of Shirley Temple like blonde curls. And she always called me her sweetheart. And she'd come running out, sweetheart, sweetheart, and <laughs> run into my arms. I mean, it sounds, it's sort of cliche, but That's th amazing. Those, are, those are very happy moments for me. What is the biggest adversity you've faced? I think my, my perfectionism. Uh, you know, I know I've, I've been good at what I've done. Um, but even if something was widely acclaimed, if there was one little bit of it that could have been better, I still think about it. I've gotten better about it. I used to beat myself up over it. Um, now I just accept that, you know, um, we're never seldom. You know, sometimes you actually hit the bullseye. But if you're just on the somewhere on the target, that's not too bad. Uh, I'm not as hard on myself as as I used to be. What are you most excited about? You know, it's a now, you know, <clears throat> the title up here, NLU, nothing left unsaid. I want to make sure that there's nothing left unsaid, especially to those I care most about. Um, you know, I think, Tim, that you're now more acutely aware of this than most people are. Um, my mom lived to be in her early 80s. We had a very close relationship. And yet you realize, <clears throat> wait a minute, did I forget to say this? Or something occurred to me that I never discussed with her. Um, my sister passed away when she was only 65. She's a remarkable person. She had stage four breast cancer for 10 years and fought it off, fought it off. She's just like tougher and more courageous than a Navy SEAL and a, and a, Pro Bowl linebacker combined, um, and and we were we were close. But then you say to yourself, "Wait a minute, did I did I pay enough attention to that? Did I leave this unsaid? I don't want to leave anything unsaid. Uh, it matters less professionally, but you'd like to have a, a last chapter or two, whether it's in a book or or some program that." that aligns with not just your ability, but your sensibility. So that, but that's less important than the people you care most about. Make sure that you haven't left anything important unsaid. Bob Costas, it's been a pleasure and a great honor to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Troy. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barclay Damon's team, 
of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to BarclayDamon.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Nurse Corps, the heart of healthcare. This is the home healthcare company that I personally use. I also wanted to give a special thanks to all my amazing nurses. For more information, go to nursecore.com. I want to thank my partners at Barclay Damon for supporting this podcast, Nurse Corps for their truly amazing team, and of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com. For cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital, if you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.